Hello everyone, hope you're having a glorious day. What determines gender? This is on the minds of many people and is being discussed in our culture today. So is it chromosomes, genitalia, secondary sexual characteristics? Or is it culture, stereotypes, emotions, the affirmation of parents, of teachers, friends, social media, and culture? Let's take a look into this topic today. Now, in biology, instructions determine construction, which demonstrates function. So the instructions are your DNA, your chromosomes. The construction is a penis or a vagina. And the function is, uh, well, a perfect fit for intercourse. So an illustration of this is if I received a bike in pieces, how would I figure out how to put it together? I would read the instructions. And so the construction would lead to a form that, uh, well, you could just give kids a bike and they'll figure out what it's for. If you ask a question, what is my gender? What is the aboutness, the intentionality, the function that exists in biology? In biology, a vagina perfectly fits with a penis. Now, there are differences as well in the brain of things like the amygdala. Uh, the amygdala is constructed differently in females with XX versus males with an XY. And it has different activities. There's no, uh, there's no culture on the planet uh, that the primary caretakers of children are males and this probably has a lot to do with the function and construction of the amygdala. Now the other thing to think about is that every cell in the body has the instructions for the gender. So XX equals female, XY equals male. Bruce Jenner, if he were unconscious or she were unconscious, Caitlyn, sorry, Caitlyn Jenner, if um, was unconscious in a car accident, they would identify him as male from his DNA. And a determined trait is something like eye color. So genes determine traits. Uh, this is like gender or sex. So if you have a Y chromosome, that develops into a male. If you have no Y chromosome, that develops into a female. And people always want to talk about the rare exceptions of aneuploidy or some of the other uh, uh, genetic disorders, but that only exemplifies the point more because if the gene is there, it is expressed in a one-to-one -one correlation of how it's uh, being represented. So genes determine traits, traits of genitalia, traits of secondary sexual characteristics like beards and traits are determined by the genes. So feelings have many influences and are not determined by genes. So traits are not feelings. Uh, again, traits are de uh, determined by, by genes. And our greatest example, our greatest proof of this are the genetically identical monozygotic twins. So these are same genes, same genitalia, same sex, same gender, every single time. So we never get identical twins where one is a female, one is a male. They're always the same, uh, uh, they're, they're always the same sex, the same uh, gender. Now, feelings involve the mind. Traits have no choice. So feelings can change, they're transient. Traits are permanent. They can't be changed. So, uh, well, without the exception of maybe surgery or something like that. But some would argue that gender is different than sex. Gender is a separate issue. Gender is a role that culture unjustly places on us. And they make this case of using their preferred pronouns of they, them, theirs. So what's the big deal? Does it really matter? Well. That's the question, are gender and sex the same or different? So historically, we've always uh, defined gender as an objective, concrete, observable fact. And so this is something logical, knowable, and important. Think about bathrooms. Uh, 
Now, if we choose to define gender as a subjective feeling, well, feelings are not easily apparent in a public transactional way, like beards are, or soft jawlines, or widened hips. And so we cannot immediately access internal feelings of others. Uh, we might, uh, you know, feelings are private. They're fleetingly transient, and they're a matter of the opinion of the day. So should parents allow their children to choose their own gender? Well, let's take a look at what some of the data shows. What does the science show behind this? And that is wait and see in gender dysphoria works. Wait and see approach is something where you just watchfully wait or you use a therapy that affirms their biological sex. So an XY would be a boy, an XX would be a girl. And if you don't make any big deal about it, while they're going through a period of, uh, of an Ericksonian stage of identity versus role confusion, they might try on different things, different identities. And one of these things might be a different gender. And over time, uh, it passes. So 88% of girls, 98% of boys outgrow gender dysphoria by late adolescence with a wait-and-see approach. Now this Swedish study in 2011, following 324 patients for 30 years, found that persons with transsexualism after sex reassignment have considerably higher risks for mortality, suicidal behavior, and psychiatric comorbidity than the general population. So the authors went on to say, our findings suggest that sex reassignment may not suffice as treatment for transsexualism. The American uh, College of Pediatricians uh, put out this paper, and you can reference it online by just going to American College uh, of Pediatricians. And they talk about uh, some points, I think six points or so, on gender ideology uh, and why they feel it harms children. Now, I will say, this, it, these are some uh, pediatricians that are basing this on their observations of uh, their practice and science. Uh, there is a counter view uh, by the American Academy of Pediatrics that says kids and parents should affirm and seek out services to affirm whatever gender the child says they are. Uh, so what do you think? Um, is uh, this uh, in the best interest of children? Um, please leave your comments below. I hope this is helpful in bringing out some of these issues so that we can understand uh, each other and what is the best way forward for our communities, for our children, for our culture, for our families. Thanks for listening.